Então é isso, eu vou seguir em inglês aqui e depois, enfim, aí vocês aproveitem. Ah. Exactly. <laughs> Stop. If you want to put this, it's better for you to hear yeah. yourself. Yeah. I, I will. <laughs> Firstly, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and for all the support that our Brazilian fans give us. It's been amazing from day one. I mean, we got a lot of come to Brazil messages <laughs> <laughs> before we came to Brazil, during being in Brazil, and leaving Brazil. Come, come to come, Brazil. Come to yes. Brazil. And, well, and we came. Now we're here. And God willing, we'll come again. <laughs> so yeah, I just told them that uh, we're, we're gonna just go ahead and do this all in English, and then we'll um, have it all with subtitles so everybody can, you know, okay. understand yeah. everything. And this is for the sake of the dynamic of the event, so we have this flow going, sure. and sure. we don't have to stop every time to translate. By the way, this is my friend John. He did a lot of work to make this happen, so it's my I want to say man. thank you. But I, I want to start, you know, I want to start this just thanking you for being here, being so nice. And I told you when we were talking about, you know, putting this together and you were like, no, nah, it's going to be like 15 guys there. And I yeah, was like, come know, on, you... man. <laughs> Maybe 20. <laughs> and there's like a thousand people here. <laughs> but we're going to try to get everybody yes, a signature and as fast as possible. But I want to thank you and uh, thank you for everything actually it's like uh, it's it's a pleasure for me to do this because it's um it's really it's amazing to be able to talk to you and talk about a little bit of your development as a as a person as a musician you had you have such an, a peculiar way of playing drums and to write music i had the uh, amazing opportunity to um, record with you and write music with you and uh it's crazy to see how your mind works you know, when you're writing and when you're uh, doing music. And it's really amazing. And, and this here, it's very special for me because I, I really wanted to understand, you know, a little bit of how, how did you develop there? I mean, I mean um, and, and it's cool if we can, you know, start from the beginning and if you can tell us a little bit about your, um, your upbringing, uh, how was uh, your access to music. And uh, a lot of people think, that you come from Armenia, and I know you, you come from Lebanon. So just talk a little bit about that and your... your you, so you want basically to... Yeah, a little bit of... A broad yeah. range. Okay, so yeah. I was born in Lebanon, and I am, of course, of Armenian heritage. Everybody in system is. And we moved, uh, without getting into too much of the details of it, but we moved of out of uh, Lebanon because of civil war in Lebanon. So we had to leave and... Ended up in uh, the United States eventually. First went to Canada, took asylum, and then ended up in the United States. And, you know, had a very normal upbringing. You know, my parents both worked very hard. My mother was a school teacher. My father was a, a musician at night. And he cut hair during the day, which was good for me because I got my hair cut for free. <laughs> you know? And um, I would say, like, a majority of my influences from my father like especially in the, uh, especially in my formative years, because he was always playing, you know, and I would see him getting dressed in his tuxedo to go to work on a Friday night and a Saturday night and Sundays. But playing, to, playing professional. To play like weddings and, okay. you know, he was a professional, but, you know, he had to make money. Okay, so he had like a, a day job and then... Right, he cut hair during the okay. day and, okay. then, and then he would play every weekend. So my dad pretty much worked seven days a week my entire... Uh, childhood you know but we had a very strong family unit we did a lot of things together and uh, he would influence me in a number of ways number one my parents did not want me to play drums oh really yeah sorry let me turn that off <laughs> r2d2 <laughs> it's probably <Sorry>. Theo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might be so um, they did not want me to play music in general because my father knew uh, being a jazz musician in Lebanon and all the things that come along with being a musician, you know, like there's a possibility of getting into drugs, it's hard to raise a family on it, all of the things that are the pitfalls of music. But that's not really what I was interested in or focused on. I just wanted to play drums from a very early age, probably like three years old. Really? Yeah, I would mimic drummers. And I remember... Um, like naturally? Naturally, okay. yeah. Like uh, my dad would be playing a wedding or something and I, all of a sudden I'd be on the stage 
mimicking the drummer as like a four-year-old child at the front, you know, and the... And always the drums. Always the drums, yeah. I couldn't, I can do nothing else musically, really. I'm horrible on everything else. You've seen me try to play guitar. <laughs> um, but anyway, like, uh, eventually after every Christmas and every birthday and every event saying, I want a drum set, I want a drum set. What do you want for Christmas? I want a drum set. What do you want for your birthday? I want a drum set every single year. Finally, at 15, they got me a drum 15. set, you know, and that was it. That was the beginning and the end of it because I spent every hour possible practicing, playing, trying to figure out things. And I was very fortunate because not only did I have my dad's influence of all his jazz albums and everything else, but I had cousins and friends who introduced me to different kinds of music, rock music and, you know, different genres that I hadn't been introduced to since. I think that's very important to have in your life, you know, like a community of friends, relatives, different people that introduce you to things that they're passionate about. Because many of you, or probably all of you here are System of a Down fans, and you'll probably give that passion over to the next generation of people in your family, your friends, or whoever. And that's how we continue to learn and know about this music, right? I mean, there's a reason we still listen to Beethoven and Mozart. They've been gone a long time. There's no recordings of them from back then. But the music was so profoundly powerful. different and powerful yeah. And that's the ones we know about. Think about all the ones we don't know about, right? But we're in, a, we're in a time where we can learn about things and we can convey it easily and even share the music with each other, you know? And, and that's pretty much how I gained all this knowledge of different music. But I think also it comes from inside you. Like, like there is a little bit of, you know, they say that like uh, genius and insanity are on a blade, right? I mean, you can go to either. And I think that <laughs> system of a down is a great example of that because there is great genius in the band. You know, I think that uh, Darren is, I've never seen a songwriter like Darren and I've never seen a lyricist like uh, Serge. Serge. And I think people don't understand how much Shavo's contributions in the songwriting have affected the band. Some of our biggest and best songs were written by Shavo originally, you know, or at least uh, parts of them were. So to be in a band like that, where we have that much talent, of course there are negatives to that too. You know, like we're all a little bit nuts, basically. <laughs> it's more than that. Not yeah, a We're really bit. nuts? <laughs> okay. Right. Matter of opinion. But um, it's, it, it's funny because, I mean, it's so natural for you to speak like that, of course, because you are you, but um, it's everything that you play, all the ideas and the way your mind works Uh, when you're, and this is like, this is my opinion, but I know a lot of people share the same opinion, that you are, you, you are like a, probably one of the, the most important uh, people in the band for that bass, because you, the way you explore the rhythms is just too out of nowhere, or crazy. Uh, the first time I heard, I mean, this is to this day, when I listen to, to System of a Down, I'm, I'm still like, how, how can they, Go, uh, go this way because it's just so crazy, you know. And I, I, I want to understand like what, what, what's what's the gap? I want to try to bridge the gap like between listening to all the the Slayer and or John Bottom or Keith Moon yeah. or all your influences mm -hmm. to you know become what you become when you're writing music. You know what I'm saying? Well, I I could only speak from my experiences, you know, and mm -hmm. my experiences aren't going to be something that works for everybody and everybody has their own path in life. But for me, it was really just about focusing only on drums for three or four hours every day in the beginning. But, and, but, but uh, were you playing with any like record? Like with yeah, anyone? I would just, uh, we had, my, my, dad's ha my dad had a very nice stereo system. Okay. Being a musician, it was important to him to hear music like, uh, like Properly, in a good way, in a right? Good way, like, yeah. And uh, I think I blew every single speaker. Wow, well, tried to play with it. <laughs> <laughs> so I would just put records on, mm -hmm. and I would play along with the records. And it didn't matter what the record was. So I would play the record from beginning to end. And a lot of things I couldn't do, right? So because I just didn't have the muscle memory to do it. Like, I could do it in here, but I couldn't do it my hands. So you understood feet. what it was? Yes. You couldn't, uh, I could break it down, right? Like, even from the beginning. And I had that uh, ability 
to break things down, but I just didn't have the, the dexterity, the muscle memory, like I said. So I had to develop that. And, and it was, especially in the beginning, because you make such strides, right? Like later it's harder, you know, like how much you're gonna practice to get like this much better, yeah. you know? And then other things come into play, like your family life and everything else. Sure. But I didn't have a family when I was 15 that I had to be concerned with. <laughs> the only family I had was my snare, my toms and my kick and my cymbals, right? And um, also, I was very, uh, it was hard to make ends meet, let's say, right? I didn't have any money. So if I broke something, I had to like tape sticks together. And I made the big mistake of playing Zildjian sticks back then. And as you know, Zildjian sticks break in one hit, mm -hmm. right? Or at least back then they did. Sorry, Zildjian. <laughs> <laughs> My sticks don't break. <laughs> Where are they? Okay. <laughs> um, anyway, so. I think, I think what you're saying is like, how do I get, look, where does my mind yeah. go to come up with the parts? Yeah, because it's, when you, when you look through, like, uh, when you think about the development of any normal <laughs> uh, human being, you know, when you're listening to Slayer, for example, so Dave Lombardo is a, is a good, um, maybe a good example. He has his own style, he does his thing, yes. but it comes from something. It's like, it's a development of something. System of a Down, it's, it's completely different to this day, you know, from I think that, anything. <laughs> I think that if you really break it down, you can hear the influences, right? Like, okay. But it's, I guess it's just a, it's a giant soup with a lot of ingredients. So mm. it's hard to figure out exactly where the flavor is coming from, you know, but it's, it, it really is all these different musical forms that we listen to. And because each of us listened to, you know, there were some things that we all listened to but then there were things that the guys had never listened to that I listened to, and that influenced me, right? So, I mean, look, I don't, know, I don't know why we think the way we think. I just know that we do. I can't, I can't give you the magic spell course, for it, yeah. right, or concoction. But, you know, like when we're in the studio working together, you see the way my mind works. Part of that is because that's the way we developed our style, right? That's the way we work together. And when you're working with people that have that level of genius, like the guys in system really are. You're included, man. I sure. know, but like, I, I'm not going to say I'm a genius. You, know? <laughs> you don't want to say that, but you are. <laughs> They're geniuses. And because of that, it brought out everything that I had in me. And I learned, but also before even system, I worked so hard to not sound like everybody else. Okay, you know? so always trying to like push the envelope. Just yeah, if, doing something different. If if this was the beat, I wanted it to be just a little bit different, so that if that was what was expected, it kind of hit you, and maybe it was uncomfortable in the beginning. You know, maybe it wasn't something you wanted to hear, but after a while, it got inside you, and then you couldn't hear anything else. And that's really the advice I give to people is. First, be yourself, right? Like whatever that is. Take your influences, put them together, and create something new. Secondly, don't play necessarily for somebody else. Because the only judge of your art is you, right? And then you give it to the world, and it's them to enjoy or not enjoy. There are probably just as many people that don't like System of a Down as there are that do. The strong reaction is important. But also, everybody's story is different. You know, you, you have different bands. They have different paths. Our path was that one. As to, as to how we think and all that, it really is just trying as much as possible to create something unique because we're all working with the same notes, the same chords, the same drums, the same everything else. But how do we utilize them? What, what order do we put things in? And does that order work? Or maybe it's the one that doesn't work that sounds the best, right? Maybe it makes you just a little bit uncomfortable. And how do you make that so that it becomes comfortable? <laughs> <laughs> was, it, was it hard for you guys, though? I mean, was it a, a, a challenge? Because who, who, who had the, um, the final decision? Because, right, I mean, you, you have like four guys trying to push the envelope and trying to do something different. Was it really like, was it like a big fight for you, for, for you guys to no, write music? No, I, I don't think it was a big fight. I, I think that, well, we did fight. You, know, you did. Right? As any... <laughs> Everybody knows it did, man. Every... Uh, I mean, real fight. <laughs> every marriage has fights, guys, you know? Like, and, 
and uh, being in a band is being in a marriage, except it's not with one person, it's with three, maybe five, whatever it is. And, you know, you have different attitudes and mentalities, and then other people come in, you know, try to influence you from the outside. That's why when you, when you, I get uncomfortable when you talk about my drumming and, you know, because I respect your drumming as well, but I get uncomfortable because at the end of the day, I was in bands before System, and people would come up to me and say, oh my God, you're drumming this, that, right? But they wouldn't talk about the band, they wouldn't talk about the songs. And then when I got into System, it was the first time that I was in a band, my drumming was still my drumming, but they were talking about the songs, and that was more important to me than my personal accolades, right? Because then you're a part of something much bigger, and then all your creativity comes together. Now, of course, we fight, we disagree, you know, um, I'm not going to say we're always diplomatic about it. I'm the type of person, for better or worse, that if I believe something, I will not compromise that. You know, like, mm -hmm. uh, you have to give me real defi definitive evidence for me to change my mind. That's maybe a flaw, you know, but that's also because I'm principled in that way, you know. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have to really have too many fights with the music. So kind of the process was, Usually Darren would bring in a song, play it for me, play it for the guys, and then I would have about 10 minutes to come up with the drum part, right? So as he's, as he's playing the song for me for the first time and humming, <laughs> I don't know what happened, but he would, be, he would be humming the melody or singing a melody that wasn't necessarily the final, but something to work on. As he's doing that, I would not be playing, but I would be picturing what I might do on, the, on those parts, right? So it's kind of like, I, I guess it's kind of like painting. You see the canvas, it's blank. And everybody sees the canvas as blank. But what you see going on that canvas is what differentiates you from everybody else. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's what I would do. I would listen to the song, and I'd be like, okay, what would a, what would a typical beat that you know, 99% of people would come up with, and I would say, I'm not playing that, you know? So then I would challenge myself to come up with something more interesting, lay down like a basics, because literally I would have 10 minutes, you know? I remember uh, one song in particular, I'll, I'll talk about two songs. One was Chop Suey, which probably would not have made the album, because I hated the song. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really hate the song. I hated what I was doing on the song. Okay. And because of that, I couldn't like the song, right? So it was like two weeks in, and it was just bad. You know, like it wasn't working. It was kind of a disjointed song, right? Like it went to weird places and like... This is already at the studio recording no, and producing or just like pre-production? We did pre-production okay. for, for the times we made albums, you know? So we would, we would go in four to six months and do pre-production. Yeah. How you doing over there? Good. Okay. Nobody's getting close. We're making. Sure. <laughs> um, so it was like two weeks in, and I was just very frustrated. So I didn't really want to play the song anymore. I was going to assume that that would be one of the songs that just wouldn't make the album, because for uh, for Toxicity we recorded I think like 44 songs. Oh my God! Yeah. Really? And that was kind of how we did it. You know, we always, always. had a lot of songs. Okay. And then when we kind of not necessarily the best songs, but what worked best together to make an album, right? So it just wasn't working. And then finally one day I came in and I put in like that like kind of blast beat thing. And I was like, oh, that's different, weird, right? That, but it works. And then it just kind of came together. And then I loved the song after that, <laughs> you know. Um, toxicity happened a little bit differently. So for that song, Shavo brought in the main riff. We played around with it a little bit, but there wasn't really much else, right? Like it was the main riff and then nothing, right? So we played it a little bit and Rick Rubin came in and heard it and he's like, well, it's not really ready yet. Take it home and keep working on it. So Darren took it home. He added another song that he'd been working on and kind of put them together, you know, um, and then brought it back in. And to the, at this point, I had nothing for it drum-wise. And I remember... Um, 
again, I get like 10 minutes to come up with my, my drum parts. They're all standing there watching me, you know? Like, come up with something, you know, do your job. And uh, I, I was trying some different things, and Shavo was getting frustrated. And he was like standing right here, you know? And he was like, do this, you know? Like, doing like, <laughs> doing movements with his arm. I'm like, well, do what? What is that? <laughs> Where's the sense. kick doing in the height? You know, what are you doing? You're just waving your arms. So I was making fun of him, waving my arms, and okay. that's how I got the beat for Toxicity. <laughs> the, all that, doom, ba, um, ba, that came from making fun of Shavo. Oh, man. And it ended up getting out of the album. That's crazy. You know? That's probably the, the beat that I'm most known for, if you think about it. So Shavo technically yeah, he is responsible with, <laughs> with the spaghetti arms for coming up with that beat. How was the, uh, the, the role of Rick Rubin when you guys started uh, working with him at the studio? I can't think of anyone outside of the band that is more responsible for like the smallest little difference that made the song what it is than Rick Rubin. I can't say enough good stuff about him. The guy's, I've never seen anybody like him, the way he works. It's, it, he doesn't have to say a lot, you know? He has a funny way of uh, passing on songs that he doesn't like. When he doesn't like it. Yeah, he just goes, next. <laughs> So, you know, we worked on the song for six months. <laughs> Next, you know. But, like, uh, he would just sit there and say, okay, well, try playing that verse half as much. Small things, right? And maybe add a tag at the end of this. And it would, like, change. You know what I'm talking about, bro. We've done this together, too. Yeah. It, it, sometimes you get somebody else's perspective, right? Because you're so immersed in the song, you can't look at it objectively. And that other person looks at it from a perspective that's opposite of yours and can look at it really in a different way and give you a little suggestion that makes you look at it a different way because you're too close to it to look at it that way. And that's what Rick does the best. He allows the artist to be the artist. He doesn't put his taste in, in your music. That's why he can produce Jay-Z, he can produce us, he can produce Metallica. He could do Shakira. He could do everybody, It's right? not about his taste. It's not about it's his about taste. And his taste is everything. Yeah. Which kind of works for System, right? Because System is like a collection of every taste together. Maybe that's what makes us so unique, you know? Um, there's another funny story with Rick. Uh, there's a song called Revenga. Um, some of you guys know that. <laughs> some okay. of you guys know that. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> have you ever seen Scarface? Everybody here? Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So there's a guy named Ribenga, is his name. Okay? So Shavo and I watch Scarface all the time. You know, anytime it's on TV, we're on tour, we had nothing to do. We didn't have iPhones, we didn't have iPads. So we watch Scarface all the time. And I was like, this song, we should call it Revenga. But I don't speak Spanish, so I thought it meant revenge, you know? Like Revenga. <laughs> And then we're watching it, and it's subtitled, and the subtitles say, Rebenga says, I'm like, oh, man, that, oh that doesn't need Rebenga. <laughs> but then again, I thought, God, I cicatres meant three. So I was playing blackjack one time, and I go, God, I cicatres, I needed a three, you know? And it means Scarface. And the lady was like, you know, what are you saying to me? But anyway, <laughs> we're in the studio, and I put like a, kind of a Latin beat on that song going with the Latin Revenga theme, right? And everybody hated it, you know? They hated the beat. They're like, do something else. But I'm used to this, right? So when they said, okay, we don't like that beat, I was like, no problem. In two days, they're going to forget that they don't like that beat, and I'm going to bring it right back. So I did something else knowing that I'm going to bring that beat back, <laughs> right? That's the game. Two days later, I brought it back. Nobody noticed. I just kept doing it, you know? <laughs> And then finally, Rick came in. You know, he would come in like every month and hear what new songs we have during pre-production. Pre-production, yeah. okay. So we're playing him Revenga, and this has never happened before or since, okay? I start playing the beat, which is the dun 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 dun, dun you know, like the hi-hat going up mm -hmm. and down, and he gets up and starts dancing. Now you can imagine Rick Rubin dancing. <laughs> never happened before. And then after the song was done, he goes, that's the best beat you've ever created. Oh. And Shavo and Darren go, yes, that's the best beat. The two people that didn't like the beat, that's the best beat you've ever created. I was like, thank you for liking the beat that you hated. Uh, 
what was the um, how was the uh, the changing like when you guys really like got signed and, and had your like first uh, big hit? How was how did it change your life back then? How was the uh, how did you perceive that? I, you know, I didn't really think much about it. It was such a gradual thing that happened. Like uh, the first week, I think we sold like uh, I don't know if it was fifteen hundred or three thousand. CDs the first week, and I was like, oh my God, we sold that many, I don't know that many people. So people that I don't know were buying our CDs, you know? And it was just like, you know, you play so long, and, you, and it, it costs you money to be a musician, right? It costs you money to be an artist. And you have to do every job that you don't want to do. I hated working, hated. I got fired from every job, except for summer camp, that was fun. But like, And then we were signed, right? So now we had a chance to be successful. How old were you back then? I was probably 25. 25. Okay. By the way, at 24, I was like, it's not going to happen. Really? Yeah, I was you giving thought. up. It's not going to happen. But I said, okay, let me just... I was in a band. We didn't have a singer for two years. We were just playing every day. And I knew that we had the talent. And I was watching all these bands on like MTV and stuff. And I'm like, they suck. You know, like I was angry about it. I, I know, maybe I'm naturally, I have some anger problems, but <laughs> I was really angry and frustrated because I was like, I know I'm better than them and they don't have the talent and their music's not very good. Why are they getting signed? And I was angry at the industry, but then they signed us and I got a little happier about the industry because we should, probably shouldn't have been signed. You know, we're too avant-garde for a major label. And I don't think if Rick Rubin was there, we would have been signed to a major label. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I digress back. How to did it happen, point. though? Just to He came. There were, you know, everybody was hearing about System. You know, we were selling out the Roxy, the Whiskey. We're an unsigned band. And that hadn't happened, um, you know, since, like, Guns N' Roses time. So all the labels were coming to the shows, but they didn't know what the hell to do with System of a Down, right? Yeah, I mean, what, what shelf like, are what you What do you do with this? Yeah. What yeah, is this? Too crazy. You know, like, yeah. I think a I lot of people still look at that. Man, yeah. So none of them were making us the offer. They were kind of waiting. And that, the labels do a lot of this. So I'll say the positive of, of big labels like Sony and Universal and all the big labels is that once you give them the product, so to speak, their machine can get it to the populace. Right? So they're really good at distribution, really good at advertising, all that stuff. And if they stay out of the artist's way, right, which they did in our case, because we had Rick Rubin, so they just didn't bother us ever, then the artist can produce the best possible art that they can for you to then use your machine to get that to the people. So we were lucky in that way. And we did eventually get signed, because Rick came to a show, and he saw us one time, and he goes, I want to sign you. And then everybody wanted to sign us. Mm. That's the way it works. So they needed like one guy to come and They're followers, not leaders. Yeah. But that's okay because they have their purpose, yeah. right? Not everybody serves the same purpose. So what were we talking about um, before? Um, anybody know? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we got signed. We, we made the record. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was yes. asking about the change. I was so excited yeah. that yeah. you know we'd sold that many records and then we went on the road. And we lost money every week. Really? You know? And we were in a, we were in a RV. It broke down at, like every yeah. three days. I've been there. You know? And uh, I have to be honest with you. A lot of people don't know this. Not only am I a drummer, but I'm also an RV driver. You know? And I had to drive the RV in the beginning. Were you back because then I, driving that? I'm certainly not going to trust Shabo to drive it. Okay? Because he, <laughs> he has a can of Coca-Cola in this hand, a cigarette in this hand out the window. He's driving with his knees and there's a bong in the middle of the slide. <laughs> and it's a 40-foot RV, okay, with a trailer. With all the equipment. And I'm looking then. at him, you know, like, where, why, where's your hands? Why aren't your hands on the wheel? Because those RVs, if a truck passes by, it'll, it'll, the wind distribution will throw you off the, you know? The road, yeah. And then Darren drove. That wasn't going to work, right? Like, uh, I think he almost killed us like three times. Okay. <laughs> and then if Serge had kept driving, none of you would know System of a Down because we would not have made it to our second show. Because <laughs> like, driving 15 miles per hour on the freeway isn't going to get you to the show. 
So I had to drive for like the first month. I'd play a show. I'd get in the RV and I'd drive us to, you know, eight hours to the next city or whatever. But like while this was happening, we were selling a little bit more this week, a little bit more the next week. Remember, we didn't go to radio with our songs. So it was just playing these shows, getting people to know us. And, you know, we went to Europe with uh, Slayer, our Slayer. first tour, and Sepultura was on that tour yeah. as well. And we played with Slayer in the United States, and that was a big dream, right? Like, oh my God, we're playing with Slayer. So that was the, like the first big... If my career had ended there, I would have been happy. Okay. I played with Slayer on tour, and I toured, and I put out an album. I can't ask for more. Now I can go work at Costco. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. I would have been happy. But then, like, slowly, we'd sell more and more. And, uh, you know, eventually they put sugar on the radio. And then it really became drastic because the numbers went crazy. And before you know it, we'd sold a half a million records. And then I remember we were all on the bus. At that point, we, I wasn't driving the RV anymore. And we were all on the bus. And we got a phone call from our manager who said, congratulations, you're a gold record selling band. That's awesome. And I was like, wow. That's awesome. 500,000 people know who we are. You know what I mean? Like, think about it. Like the, the fact that all these people are here today is pretty amazing. And it's a very humbling thing because I couldn't get four people to come see my bands play when I was younger. In fact, I played many shows where I would take lug my drum set to the venue and set up and everything and I would play for my girlfriend and the bartender yeah. you know I did that many times and I'm sure that a lot of you are musicians and you've had similar experiences and I'll say that that's just a part of it you know you have to pay your dues you have to learn all those we used to call them live rehearsals right you learn from every one of those things and and you have to suffer for your craft at the end of the day nothing's going to come easily but it's the people that stick with it have the talent, meet the right people. All these things have to go right. And then you have to try to keep it together. It's not easy that keeping a band sense. together. Um, How is your process today for like writing or practicing? Do you have any like um, any system that you use to, to practice or to no, not really. play um, music at all? I don't practice very often. You know, like a, I think I'd be a much better drummer if I did. You know, but there's a little bit of pain associated with me sitting on a drum set. Mm -hmm. And it's more of an emotional pain than anything else. Because mm -hmm. as much as we've accomplished with System, I feel like we haven't accomplished what our potential was. And because of that, when I sit on the drum set, I'm a very emotional person. You know, I know people don't think so because I don't smile and stuff. But you know, <laughs> my emotions are on the inside. I'm not trying to put on a show for people. Mm -hmm. you know? So when I sit behind my drum set, it's really hard for me not to think about all the years that we could have been producing music together, if not for our own egos, right? Like, you know, ego killed town, right? I still think you should put an S on it. I know. Um, I was waiting for you to say that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I don't have the motivation to sit behind a drum set, right? But lately, I've been starting to get that motivation back. Maybe because my kids love it when I play drums, and they come, they sit there, they watch. You know, they have their little headphones on and, um, you know, they're watching their dad who to them is their dad, right? Like not the drummer for System of a Down. And, uh, you know, that motivates me, but also because I've let it go. You know, I've gotten to the point where there's only so much I can do. I can't, uh, I can't make the band make another record. Although, guys, if you heard the songs that we do have, I think you'd be impressed by them. Maybe you will hear him one day. I don't know. Maybe if I stop thinking about it, it'll happen. Right? We'll put that out there. <laughs> Let's see what happens. That's cool, man. I mean, thank you. Thank you so much again for doing this. Yeah, We're going to open for a few questions. Sure. If you don't mind. Uh, Fala. Hi, John. Oh, hi. <laughs> We got questions from the people, so I'd like to make them to you. Okay. So the first thing is, what's the most challenging song to play live? Well, um... No, that one's <laughs> that one's actually pretty easy for me. <laughs> Let me think about that. Probably Sad Statue, which we've only played live like twice. Um, I'm not very good at double bass. And the problem with that song is there's a really fast double bass part and then a really fast blast beat part right next to each other. 
and there's no time to rest or breathe. Very you could probably do it better than I can at this point. But uh, that would be the – that's probably why we don't play that very often, by the way. Is because uh, come on I, guys, yeah. <laughs> let's do another one. <laughs> Maybe we put that to the side and play the next one. You talked about Rivenga being specially special for you. So, what's the song that you're proudest of? What original song? Hmm. Um, probably Soldier Side. There's just something about that song, and like I, I can envision the story of it. You know, I can envision the loss and, you know, humanity sent so many of our best to die for absolutely no reason. And, uh, and the loss of that, yeah, they lose their lives and that's a tragedy, but the real loss is the family and the friends that have to go through their lives without that person in their life. And we've all lost somebody tragically, car accident, something else. Those things are accidents and they're tragedies, but they happen. But we willingly go and we fight other human beings who just want to have a life just like ours, raise their family, enjoy good food, and work. You know, and, and the simple things in life is what they want to experience, and they'll never get that. And we kill each other for really absolutely no reason, in my opinion. Awesome. Well, you said that you are an emotional person. Yes. Have you, you put have to start <laughs> <laughs> No, please. Have you put that into lyrics? Two or I don't write lyrics. I don't have to write lyrics because I have the best lyricist in the world. So, you know, I'm not going to be able to compete with Sarah John lyrics. Um, I have thrown a couple of words in here and there, you know, but uh, generally I'm not credited because credit is not important to me. You know, what's important to me is having the songs be as good as possible. But as far as my writing is concerned, I do have a comic book that um, I've written. And there's my new artist right there. We got a Brazilian artist, guys. Oh, yeah. He's fantastic. And uh, I'm in the process of figuring out how to translate it into Portuguese and put it out in graphic novels, like one a year, so that you guys can enjoy it. I hope you like it. Since we touched the subject, um, what made you venture into the comic book world? Well, I've, I've been a, kind of a massive comic book nerd since I was 12. You know, um, I'm just attracted to the, to the hero aspect of it because they don't do it for money or for fame or for anything else. They do it to serve their fellow man and they sacrifice themselves. I don't know, there's something idealistically that I admire about that. And I also think that in a lot of ways, comics were created, most, for the most part, they were created uh, right at the beginning of World War II, or right before World War II. And if you could imagine what, how scary it was to live during that time and not know what's going on, and like the, the amount of, the amount of devastation and carnage that we were going to see, especially after World War One, and we didn't learn our lesson from that, and it was starting to happen again. And can you imagine what it felt like to live anywhere in the world during that time? And basically, these Jewish people in New York. My opinion, and this is not fact, but my opinion is they felt so powerless knowing what was happening to their people. Trust me, I know the feeling of powerlessness. My people are constantly being killed for no reason, except that we're Christian and we live where we, are, we live. And um, I think they created Superman because that's who they wanted to be so they, they could affect justice, you know, so they could protect those who had no ability to protect themselves. So there's something that I'm attracted to for comics. Plus, the colors are cool, and um, the stories are fun, and a lot of mythology in comics. Um, is there any comic artist that influenced you, like, a lot? Comic artist, not so much. I just appreciated it. You know, like, uh, I'm best friends with Jim Lee, uh, for those of you who know yeah. comics. So he'll sit there and draw something, and I'm, like, watching him, like, how do you do that? Like, how's that coming out? Because when I try to draw something, it looks like shit, you know? <laughs> so, but then again, if he sits on a drum set, it's not mine. <laughs> so we all have our thing. But I, I really admire artists of all genres, or, or whatever it's called, you know? Um, anybody that could paint. Sculpting is amazing, right? Like, have, have you seen the sculptures where it looks like they're wearing, like, a veil? How the hell do you do that? Crazy. You know, like, I'm mesmerized by it. And... 
And I think that's part of the inspiration, and you take that and you put it into your art. And hopefully we inspire back. That's the goal. Besides music and comics, do you have any hobbies? Well, yeah, I have a lot of hobbies. I play with Legos. As, as, do you really? As every 51-year-old should. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I like to... Um, I like to buy properties and reimagine them. I guess that's a hobby. You know, like my wife hates me for it because pretty I buy a house. Hobby. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's pretty expensive. <laughs> but like, I guess, I guess the point is just to take something that exists and make it better. So whatever that is, whether it's writing a story that I think needs to be told or playing drums in a certain way on a, on a project or playing with Legos and just imagining a massive castle out of it that's just out of your brain, you know? Like, I always kind of did that with Legos anyway. But the, the objective is whatever I'm doing, I want to make it better, you know? In my point of view, I don't care about what other people think. If I think it looks better, that's what's important. And that's what you should be as an artist. You should please yourself only. Cool. Any special projects for next year? Uh, nothing I can really talk about. <laughs> Nothing I can talk about, really. I'm not <laughs> legally at liberty to say. <laughs> but I will say this. I'm hoping to convince the guys to come back to South America and Brazil. Especially. <laughs> so I'm working on that. We'll see what happens. I'll twist somebody's arm maybe a little bit. And we'll see what happens. This is awesome. Thank you very much. Good. Have another question? Last one. Aqui a gente aprofunda um pouco mais nos papos, né? E eu queria saber o quanto que eles aprofundaram também na parte mais acadêmica da história, que a gente fala muito sobre isso, para poder chegar e, e compor e tocar umas músicas tipo Question, que tem uns tempos bem quebrados, uns 5, uns 6, aí e como é que eles desenvolveram isso aí entre eles? Were you guys ever musically educated at all? Like did you had uh, have teachers or I had a, I had a few lessons. I, in fact, uh, one of them, my drum teacher, Dimitri, he gave me three lessons. One of them was the bossa nova. So, really? Yeah, bringing it back to Brazil, of course, right? Um, and that actually opened up a lot of gateways. But my greatest teachers were always whatever was on the radio and whatever records I could put on and play with. So Dave Lombardo was my teacher. Um, Lars Ulrich was my teacher. Keith Moon was my teacher. John Bonham was my teacher. Neil Peart, Stuart Copeland, on and on and on. And even like uh, bands that you wouldn't necessarily expect, like Killing Joke was a huge influence for me in the mm. early days, you know? Anyway, there was a, so many bands came in and, and as a young person, you're taking all this in like a, like a sponge, you know, you're just absorbing it. And then uh, how can I play that part in the Iron Maiden song? That, that double uh -huh. pedal part. How could I do that? Because my muscles aren't doing it yet. And like trying to figure yeah, out. Trying to play, figure play, out, it's play. like a puzzle, right? Yeah. And sometimes, what they're doing is really easy, but the way you're going about doing it is so complicated, you get better because of it, right? Like, uh, you learn how to do something the hard way, and it ends up being a benefit to you. Okay, like kind of uh, develop your own technique. Technique, and also, yeah. like, uh, I think that sometimes you think something's really complicated when it's not, right? Yeah. And if you really broke it down and showed somebody, oh, no, no, that's not what I'm doing at all, right? Okay, so for example, can you sticks, a pair of sticks? Oh yeah, just play something, man. Just throw it, I'll catch it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, Revenga, right? <laughs> it's, not, it's not really that complicated. The, uh, the ride is doing this. Not complicated. The kick is just doing this. And the hi-hat snare is doing this. So, but when you put it together, it's... So it's, it's really the putting it together in a certain way that might make it sound complicated. Now the complicated that part of that song is when I go from the snare to the toms on the rolls. That's pretty hard. Oh, right? you are left-handed. That's something, right? I'm ambidextrous. Right, but, but, 
but I was I probably should have been a left-handed drummer. Okay. Because when I hold a traditional grip, right? Oh, go to the I right. I hold it like okay. this. And as you know, yeah. you're supposed to hold it like this, right? But I naturally hold it like this. So the first time I sat on a drum set, watching all these jazz players all those years, I was like, oh, you're supposed to hold one stick like this, right? And then I went to the match grip, and then it didn't matter. Is it natural for you, though, to play the, the, like a 2 and 4 or like the back beat with the right? You know, I don't know, man. Uh, I think uh, I share that in common with Ringo Starr, where, you know, also keep in mind, guys, it wasn't exactly a good thing to be left-handed at a certain point. Mm. You know, there were, well, they thought like there was something wrong with you okay. in the old days, and you know, they would make you do everything right-handed even if you were left-handed. My daughter's left-handed, and we make sure that she explores that. But again, this is where I get lucky, right? Like if I had just uh, gone to my left and put this uh, hi-hat and snare here and played like a left-handed drummer, who knows if the same roles would happen and all that stuff. It's because my brain thinks differently yeah. that naturally when I'm going to the tom, I'm going opposite of what you would do. And you've seen me play the hi-hat. Yes. You play it. When you're doing, I'm doing this, you're doing this, doing this yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But what, th what that enables me to do because I'm doing this is this hand goes to the tom before mm -hmm. you can do it. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it changes everything. Changes everything. Yeah. Like uh, I can get there before you can. <laughs> it's that little, yes. that little split second mm -hmm. makes a difference in how it feels ultimately and how the music feels because of it. You know? Totally. And what are these? I don't know. <laughs> it's <Fault and mirrors. laughs> Christmas. Okay. Anything else? I think we're good? Yeah. Well, I want to thank you. You want to say a few words? Who? My artist. Olá, tudo bem? Só queria dizer que é uma honra poder fazer parte do projeto. Já é a edição número 23. Está trabalhando duro para entregar o um melhor trabalho para vocês aí. Acho que todo mundo que curte quadrinho, recomendo a lei que vai gostar. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> I want to thank you again, man, for doing yeah, this, no, for thank real. You, yeah, it's you, a pleasure. You guys have no idea how much work he's done on this. Way more than me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the master.